And thanks for the introduction. And uh, I must congratulate uh, ABES for the topic for this session in terms of weather extremes. It's certainly uh, an issue that our industry has been confronting uh, for quite a while, and that's the topic uh, of this session uh, today. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, as an industry, we've been dealing with uh, climate risks and extremes for quite a while. We've had a whole range of issues around uh, some mortality events with, with droughts and uh, extended droughts and, and heat intensity. So we've actually done some work with CSIRO developing a handbook uh, around some of those issues uh, and, some, and around management practices to, for deal, dealing with those types of things. And, and similarly with the banana industry, we've had Cyclone uh, Yassi come through and, and cause some devastation with some of our Caribbean pine plantations and QDAF are doing some work and have some guideline documents around managing those types of issues in terms of uh, genetics, species location, or what you might do with stocking. So uh, certainly a, an issue that's very relevant to, for us. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is bushfire extremes and, and talk about that as, a, as an emerging problem. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about management experiences in, in the United States and Canada, and I need to thank the Gottstein Fellowship uh, where I had a look at these issues and policies and practices uh, middle of last year for, for a couple of weeks. Uh, and talk about what are some of the learnings from, from North America to, to apply here in Australia. And again, uh, when we're talking about fire, the key factors that, that, um, that Rob and others have talked about is you know, dryness, heat, wind and fuel all contribute uh, to fire. Now this is the Brindabella Ranges after the 2003 fires. A lot of us in the audience can, can remember those. Uh, and you can see a lot of uh, uh, scorched earth and a lot of uh, very intense fires that cause a lot of damage. Some trees have epicormic growth, growth, they're recovering, but there's a lot of dead trees. So, you know, it's a real concern, uh, not only for industry, but in terms of some of the environmental impacts and erosion from these types of, of issues. Uh, we all acknowledge that it is part of our natural environment and all the forecasts are for dry and hotter conditions. So I won't go through the, the predictions, but essentially our extreme fire rating days are going to increase. Uh, based on, on those factors. And what we're really interested in as an industry, we're a major stakeholder. We're not only uh, are affected by the, the direct impacts of fire uh, on our industries in terms of our timber resources, we actually uh, are involved in terms of the management of uh, fire risk on those areas that we manage in terms of production forests. But it's a landscape issue and it's a whole range of tenures and I think that's the issue uh, that we really uh, need to start to think about in policy, about a whole of landscape approach uh, to fuel management. And, and what we're seeing is a link not only with adaptation, in, but uh, uh, adaptation in terms of doing things like prescribed burning, but it can actually help us with some, some mitigation if we link, start to link that around renewable energy and using some of that, that fibre and material uh, for renewables. So I'll talk a little bit about that. This is just some observational data from the Department of Environment you know, show, showing the, the uh, uh, areas burned over the last few dec decades and the emissions that are associated with that. And I guess what this slide is really showing is that relative to industrial activities, uh, fires in our natural environment, the emissions profile is, is quite extreme and quite significant. And what we're starting to ask is, you know, in terms of these spikes and extreme stream events, you know, is this, is this what we're looking at uh, going forward? Associated with that is the, the concept of mega fires, very large fires, and again, this is ABARES data uh, that's reported where we've had some really big fire events in terms of area burnt. And uh, anecdotally, you know, we're starting to see uh, bigger areas and, and there's been a history of debate about uh, management of our forest landscapes. And a lot of commentators and parliamentary inquiries, inquiries are talking about the, manage, the, the, the active versus passive management. So in a lot of these areas, uh, where we had a, uh, have been transferred from production forestry to other tenures such as conservation reserve uh, that, that have tended to take a passive approach to managing for fuels. So that's, that's been an ongoing debate and part, part of this issue is, is ensuring we have the infrastructure in place to deal, deal with fires in terms of firefighting capacity and, and roads. Uh, and, and part of this trend uh, has been attributed to a downsize in that capacity that was being provided previously by, by a quite a prosperous uh, forest industry. As I mentioned, mega fires are, are recognised as a global issue, and really in the United States after the early 2000s, they had some very severe uh, fire, uh, fire events. And, and mega fires you know, being defined in terms of, you know, they're very big, they're very hot, and they, they cost an absolute fortune to deal with in terms of fighting. 
and we're seeing really an increase in, in suppression, uh, fire suppression budgets, the, the, the money that's spent in dealing with these fires. And I've just listed a whole example there of, of, of this, this international trend of mega fires. And you'd note in particular the 2009 Black Saturday fires in Victoria uh, in terms of the area burnt and, and the impacts were, fits that definition. You know, if you look at the, the cost of those fires you know, to the economy, you know, we're, we're talking about severe loss of life. Uh, we're talking about damage to infrastructure and property, uh, agriculture, fencing, and, and, and to the forest industry itself in terms of uh, the resources that are burnt. Uh, we've recently commissioned uh, Deloitte Access Economics to, to start to, to look at this problem in terms of uh, public policy, in terms of managing our landscapes. You know, are, are we better off investing in, in some managing some of our fuels in these landscapes? Uh, and, and is that, is that uh, going to give us a return in terms of avoided damage, uh, in terms of, uh, loss of loss of life, uh, emit the costs of emissions, uh, and, and just savings in terms of what we're actually spending and fighting these fires? And some preliminary, preliminary work is showing that this is uh, an area with, with property losses, insurance losses, have been trending upwards uh, quite significantly over, over the last uh, decade, and that the economics of actually doing a bit more in terms of land prevention are starting to stack up. Uh, so they did some work and it's, it's starting to show that you know, making investments in these areas will, will provide uh, a really good benefit cost return. In the United States, they've, they've dealt with the issue of what we, a large fuel, uh, fuel build-up and it's partly to do with uh, the management of, of large uh, forest areas with the Forest Service and, and their levels of tree stocking in those areas. They've also had impacts in terms of some climatic shifts that are dealing with pests and diseases. So you might have heard about the, the mountain pine beetle outbreak, and that's causing a lot of uh, damage in terms of dead trees uh, and material in that forest that can contribute then to the, the fuel risk. So they're dealing with uh, very similar issues to us. And the, the other issue, complicating factor is we're getting a high urban forest interface. We're getting communities that are moving out into peri-urban areas and moving more into the, into the natural bush and in agricultural landscapes. So again, from a public policy perspective, uh, there's a whole lot of issues around managing those risks. This is an example in, in Colorado where I visited in terms of uh, the, 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 the stocking and the nature of the, the ponderosa pine forest along the ponderosa range. And again, it's about, uh, about the natural fire histories of these areas and then uh, that they would have normally had more frequent uh, low intensity fires, but through, through the Smoky Bear campaign and excluding fires over a number of decades, it's actually allowed the vegetation to build up and it's causing uh, providing fuel for these more intensive fires. What we're really interested in is the management response. And in 2003, there was the Healthy Forest Initiative where the, the US government was, was, had identified this as a problem, but was saying we need to start to look at our regulation and our planning around doing more prescribed activity to manage for fuels. So things like the EPA, environmental conditions around doing those burns, trying to streamline those so it was actually practical but still meeting some of those environmental outcomes. And they've spent uh, almost um, 500 million on a, on a landscape restoration program uh, where they're, they're looking at uh, thinning these areas and managing those fuels, uh, which have a whole range of multiple benefits. And they're linking that to, to the utilization of some of that material. So you, you've got uh, biomass utilis utilization programs, fuels for schools where they're using that material for, for bioenergy and heating and local applications. And then, and, and, and also in their bioenergy policies themselves, their action plan, has made a link into some of these landscape issue, issues with all this fuel in the area and how they might be able to use that uh, for renewables. This is the, the landscape restoration program. Sorry, it's 400 million over 10 years. Uh, and basically, they've identified a whole areas where they're going in to, to treat these. Uh, and there's a whole lot of spin-offs from, from doing this in, in terms of job creation, as I said, utilising that material and looking at the restoring habitat conditions. Uh, in terms of moving them to more uh, fire-resistant natural regimes that were in place. Uh, this is a, an example in Arizona where you've got on the left-hand side an overstocked stand of, of ponderosa pine with a whole lot of ladder fuel, so those smaller trees are contributing to fires up into the crown, uh, which has been a major issue for them. Uh, on the left-hand side is an area that's been treated, and they're planning to treat uh, you know, over a million hectares over the next 10 years. Uh, using a combination of burning and mechanical removal. So we're quite interested as an industry uh, in, in, in looking at those types of, 
types of activities to deal with uh, you know, some of these public policy issues and providing some spin-offs for the industry and regional communities. So I mentioned they're linking it to a lot of bioenergy projects. This is just an example uh, of, of the Boulder County, a municipality that's thinning their own forests and managing the fuel and using it to, uh, to heat their own facilities and likewise at the, at the local university. In Canada, again, a similar problem to Australia. They're finding that uh, you know, they're getting these large areas of fire increasing over time. They've got very limited budgets for dealing with it and are getting very serious about, uh, about dealing with the, the fuel and the landscape. And, and in terms of their agencies, you know, they're very, uh, very uh, clear about some of their options that they're looking at, and that's in terms of you know, managing, managing those trees in the landscape, using more prescribed fire, uh, and looking at, uh, obviously, in terms of uh, emergency response, uh, but, but making some links to, to energy and biomass. In terms of the lessons for Australia, uh, we're, we're very similar to the US, West, Western United States. Uh, we've got a high urban forest interface, uh, you know, particularly in Eastern Australia and Southwest Western Australia, where predominantly our, our forests are. Uh, and, and we really need to start to think about a whole of landscape approach. In the United States, there's a real bipartisan approach to fuel management. And I think we're still having a debate in Australia about, about fuel, about fuel management. And they're actually implementing uh, these treatments, and I gave some examples of that. And uh, the, the use of combined mechanical removal and burning is becoming more common, and it's a trend that we're starting to see. And we believe that, uh, that the bioenergy industries and the forestry industries has, has a potential role in this space in Australia. And, and the bottom line is at a landscape level, it's about re re returning these landscapes to more fire resistant conditions. We've had a long history of suppression in Australia as well. Um, I didn't show the stats, but our level of prescribed burning has declined by about 50% over the last decade, uh, which has been quite concerning for us. So what we're talking about as an industry stakeholder is that we really need to look at the, the increasing our level of treatment uh, for areas that are identified as priorities. We really think a national pilot scheme is an obviously a good way to road test this, this concept. Uh, and the bushfire CRC has already identified areas in Australia where we've got overstocked areas, areas that, uh, that have, that are, uh, there's been a, a long history of suppression. I've given some examples here of, of the Pilliga scrub in Australian Cyprus where we've got a lot of, a lot of stocking, a lot of drought affected forest areas in our landscapes that uh, with active forest management in terms of thinning uh, and, and improving their health that uh, we can reduce that fire risk. Like, like similarly in central Queensland and some of the drier areas. Uh, and in some of the foothill areas of East Gippsland. So, you know, there's already some areas where we think we could start to focus in such a trial program. So in summary, I just want to finish by, by saying, you know, we, we do recognise that bigger and hotter fires are going to be a problem, and the Bureau of Met and all, all of the, the, the climate forecasters, you know, are, are really starting to show that this, this is becoming more evident. We believe that active land management can play a role. Uh, US and Canada are making some pretty serious inroads into that. We're probably about a decade behind in this space. And it's an industry, it's an issue not only for, for forestry, but for agriculture and, and more broadly in terms of uh, some of the adja adjacency issues with, with uh, agricultural infrastructure and forests. So, you know, we see it as a, as a primary industries issue uh, and we really want to see an improvement in policy settings in Australia. And the coalition government has made a start. They announced a $15 million bushfire mitigation program. So we're very keen to start to think at to start to look at preventative land management uh, around that. So I think that's um, pretty much what I wanted to say and kept within the 15 minutes. Fred.